Well, first of all, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Thank you for staying late. Well, I would like to say a few things as an introduction. I would like to thank the scientific committee. I would like to thank Antoine. I would like to tell uh, the younger ones here. Well, there are a few ones, of course, not Jean-Claude nor Valid. This concept well, we're going to play a game, actually. So in the next half hour, particularly in the next 15 minutes, uh, will not be really true. This will be what I would like to say as an introduction. And then the concept, well, the idea is well to have a boxing match with Mike Tyson and every year somebody would have to to fight him so either you say yes or no Mike Tyson well you you know who Mike Tyson would be in that game and for those of us who do not know Jean-Louis Vincent Jean-Louis Vincent is our master and I want to pay tribute to Jean-Louis Vincent but Jean-Louis Vincent can demonstrate at the end of this session, and everybody will be convinced that you do not need antibiotics in a septic shock, that you do not have to stop at a red light. So that's the principle, that's uh, the game. And uh, I would like to, to know who in this room thinks that they can be convinced by Jean-Louis Vincent not to use antibiotics in case of a septic shock. Well, 80% or 90% of the audience uh, is convinced. So there's no point in my trying to play with him. Most of my friends told me not to play with him. So my only solution was to take his computer from him. Well, anyway, we have to realize that this is going to be a very friendly discussion, a very friendly debate, and I'm uh, hoping that, uh, well, my friends will support me and the moderators will support me. They used to be friends. So the objective is uh, we have to answer this question for protective ventilation. Well, there's no question to be asked, uh, but John, we will try to convince you otherwise. Uh, well, this is what I would like to say. Should we use a low tidal volume? Yes. Well, today, um, nobody is uh, asking this question, but I would like to say that a low a tidal volume is not sufficient. Uh, There's a uh, the spirit of fair play and I was told I should not be too serious at the beginning. I asked so many friends of mine, everybody actually here, and most of them did not come this evening. I was, I was, I told them, well, you have to uh, take part in a scientific controversy with, um, well, the expert, you know who that is. So what do you suggest? So, well, I got a few answers. I shall summarize them and I shall ask for your opinion. Well, uh, the fight is lost in advance and you have to ask to be excused or you have to ask a friend to replace you. But, well, there's no friend left. You, and that was last night, Jean-Luc, I think, suggested, well, why don't you consider suicide? And I told him, well, Jean-Louis, uh, what would you do? He said, well, I would consider suicide, committing suicide with Nutella. Well, there was no Nutella in the hotel, which is the reason why I'm here tonight. Uh, I was told, well, your only hope lies in the fact that uh, your opponent will not have a computer, but Jean-Louis is listening to everything I'm saying and is going to contradict me point by point. Jean-Louis Tambour, well, if he were a friend, he would uh, help me by... Uh, and you at least tried to hold one round before being knocked out. Well, Mike Tyson was number one, and we all uh, watched uh, matches to see who could hold out and could hold a few seconds, because usually it took just a few seconds for people to be knocked out. Well, I hope I might hold for one round, and eventually there's another possibility. 
Uh, it might be that uh, the audience today will be smart and will uh, realize that Jean-Louis is going to be defeated because like any expert, like any champion, he will have to be defeated one day. Maybe not by me, but well, this will happen one day. So I do not know which option you would choose in the room. Well, I would have loved uh, committing suicide with Nutella. Now, let me uh, start being serious. What about protective ventilation? If you do the contrary, what do you do? You do not protect. Who would not protect today? I was told that, uh, well, all texts refer to protection. You've got to protect your neighbors, your friends, your lungs. So I do not understand how he will deal with uh, the lack of protection. Well, of course, we all know that prevention is better than cure. It is something we learned uh, at school. And as an introduction, I would like to show you about this study, which uh, in physiological terms is extremely interesting. And this is uh, uh, about a study on obese patients. It is uh, the Calico Sterner study. The idea was to assess a number of strategies, either to have a bank to have uh, RMs, recruitment maneuvers, or to have both. Well, this uh, obese uh, models is uh, extremely interesting. In that case, we're dealing with gas exchanges and oxygenation. And you can see the various times, um, a wake patient, a patient that has been this 20, 35, and 40 minutes after. And you can see that on standard subject, uh, uh, the compliance is not enough. Now, if you do the same thing with recruitment patients, you do not get very good results. Now, if you use uh, recruitment maneuvers, that is, you open the lung and you use a drain to keep it open, and you use PEP, sorry, to keep it open, and well, if you look at this scanner image, the upper image is PEP alone, uh, lower image is RM plus uh, ZEP, and the, in the middle you have this standard uh, operation, RM plus PEP, to keep it open, keep the lung open. And this is just uh, before anesthesia, and this is what happens in your departments. Immediately you have uh, atelectasis uh, developing. This is what is happening. We've always been told that PP is recruiting. This is not true. It prevents de-recruitment. The only possibility to recruit is uh, volume pressure. When you have a scanner image in the PP group, you can see uh, that you still have atelectasis and so you have to understand that opening is not enough. You have to open and keep open. So open the lungs and keep them open. Well, five minutes may not be sufficient for PEP to be working, but 25 minutes later, you get the same results. For the other two groups, you get a beautiful image. You can open the lung and keep it open. This is a very good image because you can understand why sometimes PEP doesn't work, why sometimes RM doesn't work, and why you have to combine uh, both. And well, here you can understand and what the message uh, I would like to to give you is that protective ventilation is a combination of a strategy. It is not a low volume. It is not PP. It is combining a moderate volume. It is having uh, the right level of PEP and uh, a combination with RMs, recruitment maneuvers. So we might give you another definition. Our moderators, our friends, for the time being, will tell us what protective ventilation is about because we have to uh, refer to the same thing. I can see that John louis is changing all his uh, slides and I'm 
getting too big in sell. Well, we, you know, too pressure, too much pressure, too much volume is not good. All this you're aware of. And I just wanted to, to to remind you uh, about those things, and I'm wondering what Joel we will do about that. Now, title volume is extremely relevant. You know about those curves. Too much volume is not good, not enough. You've got atelectasis, too much, well, you've got the VILI. And what we want is an optimal VT. Well, this is what we're looking for. Shall is not watching me, so I'm taking advantage of that. I do not understand how it's going to tell you that we need uh, higher volumes. Well, this was as an introduction. We have data, epidemiological data, uh, a study carried out by Esteban. Uh, if you're interested in ventilation, you've heard about him. For years, he's been conducting world studies to see how uh, ventilators should be adjusted. The first study was in 1998, then there was a study in 2004, and the latest one was in 2010. Well, you can see that the volumes tend to decrease from 8.8 to 6.9 on average. Nevertheless, we are under 10 or even 8. So uh, progress uh, is being made. And overall, we're convinced today that it is reasonable to use, to use volumes of 9,000 kilos. We may discuss about 9x76, but we are below 10 or 9. So that protective ventilation should be under 10. So I do not really know how Jean-Louis will tell you that we should go above. Uh, 1,000. Well, let me go quickly because, well, clinical evidence, well, you know all about it. Sean, we will tell you it is not true, it is not serious. One of the first uh, study at the Mayo Clinic was based on a database and they compared ventilated patients. Uh, with under 9,000 kilos, and they compare them with patients uh, who are ventilated with more than uh, 1,200 kilos. And um, they check whether they had a respiratory failure, and they can see the, the difference, the result. Well, I think that when I, I started uh, with Jean-Daniel Chiche, with Mira, and I think you will agree with me that we have less acute lung injuries currently. Um, at the time when we started, uh, this was frequently the case after five days. Jean-Paul and Jean-Daniel will tell us about that and will tell us what they think about it. Then you have this first uh, study. It was prospective, randomized study coordinated by Marcus Schultz, uh, which was uh, halted uh, Earlier, I would like to know what Jean-Louis thinks about it. Eventually, when you use a volume of 6,000 or 10,000 kilos, well, this is what you get. Patients will uh, develop more acute lung injury, and this is supported uh, by physiological data since there were respiratory samples. And it appeared, well, uh, now now we are at 10,000 kilos, not at 12,000. You have to, but I can see you're not convinced, although I think you should be concerned about what I'm saying. And, well, I shall stop here. We have JAMA 2012, uh, Serpaneto, a Brazilian scientist whom we're working with is uh, conducting meta-analysis, he's been working with Marcus Schultz, and he's shown that in compiling studies, small volume, low volume, well, you get the same results. Uh, this is uh, the mortality with the protective ventilation, and this is the excess mortality for the non-protected uh, group. And just to give you an idea of what is going on, uh, this uh, is ICU, and I shall I could give you the same results. Uh, this is a very nice study. They compare ventilated patients under 7,000 kilos, above 10,000 kilos, and well. 
I think this is pretty obvious. You can see prevalence of uh, ARDS, and I knew you would say that um, RDS may not be a very uh, serious criteria, but. Uh, well, mortality is very simple. When you are ventilated uh, above 10,000 kilos, mortality is three times as much as what it is at uh, 7,000 kilos. So I don't know what Jean-Louis is going to say about all of this. Of course, we do modelizations, and it's easy. A probability of developing ARDS uh, uh, vertically and uh, predicted body by, uh, volume by predicted body, body weight uh, horizontally, and the curve, well, it's, it's easy. It's what we protected. Uh, so these are patients in ICU. They have a pathology which somehow or another affects the lung. And then you have the same thing with patients who have healthy lungs, or so-called healthy lungs. They don't have any lesions that could lead to an inflammatory reaction. The, the, the whole problem comes from this paper. This paper started uh, off a process that led to thousands or even millions of deaths. Uh, journal, a New England Journal of Medicine, the best of the best. What's he saying? Uh, in the uh, operating uh, theater, um, there's hypoxia in the patient, uh, there's distress, there's telectasy. Uh, it's very easy, just uh, use higher volumes so that the lung will not close. Well, ever since, it's been demonstrated that higher volumes as compared to lower volumes avoided hypoxia. And ever since, in all textbooks, they talk about ventilating at 12, 14, 15 uh, uh, meters per kilo. Uh, it took us years to understand that it shouldn't be ventilation at 10. So, Jean-Paul, am I still out a couple of minutes? We have studies demonstrating that high tidal volumes, there's studies in uh, uh, Canada uh, demonstrating there was a high mortality among these patients. Uh, we did this work with Paolo uh, Salfini, uh, uh, abdominal surgery, high uh, volume uh, ventilated patients associated with PP uh, was not so good. And then we needed RCT. So we have two studies, European studies, uh, uh, Profilo, which is negative, but does not have, which in fact controls, con uh, compares two uh, groups, uh, high peep and low peep, but the study is negative, and we will discuss this certainly. Then it's the IMPROVE study, the French study, with a real strategy for intraoperative protective ventilation, six to eight <coughs> milliliters. PEEP 6 to 8, we're not uh, too rigid here. So it's a variation on the standard, which is what uh, Jean Louis will probably be suggesting with uh, uh, 10 to 12, ventilation at 10 to 12. This paper, French paper, demonstrated a drop in complications. Uh, pulmonary and extrapulmonary uh, going from 27% to 11% or 10.5% in the strategy for protective ventilation. You can see this on the Kaplamea that everything is mainly happening in the first week. Namely, presumably what we're doing in the operating room has an impact in the following days. So, prevention is better than cure. The uh, Provilo study is negative. Why? Because it's not comparing the same thing. It's the same uh, uh, ventilation, but high peep, low peep. And yes, you can see that in the Kaplamea, uh, the design is similar uh, because it's the high uh, peep that's uh, deleterious. Uh, so these are not contradictory studies. They're complementary because they're answering different questions. I will now go very fast in order to conclude what's the procedure that works best. It's neither a, a low uh, a peep. You understand that it's the association, in fact, of a, a low volume a, a peep and a, a recruitment maneuver. So we uh, will hear Jean-Louis, but I call upon our referees for decision. Jean-Daniel, Jean-Louis. Do we agree that protective ventilation is the association of everything that is positive as compared to protective ventilation, which is an association of everything that is not good. And uh, I do recommend uh, this uh, uh, book. 
and I do not know how Jean-Louis is going to be able to contradict this, but I'm very interested to find out. I haven't told you about all of this. As a conclusion, the main principle is that I hope I have uh, convinced you that you should not limit the volume. Don't damage the lungs by going too small or too large. Five to six for serious ARDS, seven for healthy, adapt, recruitment maneuver in patients that might benefit, but not everyone, cautiously, peep, any, uh, as much as needed, but not too much. Just open the lung, make sure it doesn't close. Uh, just sufficiently. Uh, uh, also uh, uh, limit uh, plateau pressure, which is another subject, uh, and a spontaneous breathing as, rapid as uh, rapidly as possible. I also agree with what was said earlier by uh, Jean Mans and uh, Antoine. Basically, they were saying the same thing. Uh, sedation should be done properly. I think that's the message.